there's a lot of talk about alternatives, and there's a lot of money flowing into alternatives. So why now should we be talking about putting even more money into alternatives, and who should talk about it? Well, so a couple of different questions there. So I would say first, I've spent the last you know 25 plus years at the intersection of wealth management and alternative investments, and it's never been more interesting. And I think if you step back and you look at what's happened in the private investment world, you've gone from a decade ago having four trillion in private investments to now 15 trillion in one decade. So incredible growth. But what's really fueled that, you know, over the past decade has been institutional allocators pension funds, endowments, sovereign wealth funds. But I think as you look at what's going to fuel the growth going forward, you know, Forecast would say that of the 15 trillion in privates, about four of that is in individual hands today. A decade from now, that could be triple that number, mm. right? And so I think you're seeing incredible movement into privates. And, and why should individuals be thinking about that? I think they're thinking for the first time about how do we add diversified um, returns into our portfolio? Um, uncorrelated returns, and they're looking at the tremendous results and outperformance that investors have had over the last decade in private investments. And when we talk about individual investors, to your point that there's still this underweight, I mean, I know it's a case-by-case -case basis, but is there a good rule of thumb of what sort of allocation in ultra high net worth individuals should be thinking about when they're considering going into alternatives? So, you know, I think for us, we really focus on the ultra high net worth part of the market. And we've had for a very long time a very significant allocation to alternative investments. So our CIO, Sharmin Mosavaramani, would advocate for almost 25% of a moderate client's portfolio be in alternative investments. Wow. Now, we've been on a long journey to get our clients there um, because investing in private investments is like a marriage. You're going to be in it for a very long time. And I would say we've gotten our clients maybe halfway there. But if you think about the broader individual world and you think about high net worth, mass affluent, the allocation is going to be significantly smaller because what you're really doing is trading liquidity for alpha, you know, for return. And as you go down the wealth spectrum, you can't give up as much illiquidity. You can't give us as much liquidity. Um, and so there, the allocations are going to be smaller. But we would be significant advocates for almost a quarter of a moderate risk client's portfolio be an alternative investment. Well, I must say that's, that's a big number, 25% in alternatives. But you mentioned over the last 10 years that alpha the return has been really disproportionate. But let's be fair. For a fair amount of that time, interest rates were essentially zero. So you were getting no return off of treasuries and things like that. But what about now? Is it less attractive now than it was before? Because you can get a return you know, off of uh, traditional credit, bonds, and, and certainly the stock exchange. Well, so I think first and foremost, you know, we talk about this being a long-term strategy and a strategic allocation. And so you know, it's hard to time it and to think about, is now a good time? Should I be increasing? Should I be decreasing? Our view is you have a long-term goal, and you're going to set a course and try to get to that target. And you're not going to really change with respect to market moves, interest rate moves. Um, and then there's interesting areas that will develop as a result of what's happening in the markets. So even though interest rates you know, for treasuries are high today and you can get an attractive yield, if you're willing to take on illiquidity, you can get a yield that might be double that right, as a direct lender in the corporate space. Um, and that could be an interesting place to be today, right? So even as the broader environment changes, there continue to be very attractive alpha opportunities across the private landscape. Across the private landscape, can we drill down a little bit here? I mean, when we think about sectors, industries, what, where are we seeing the most interest and the most growth, whether it be in real estate or somewhere else? So I would say the theme over the last few years has been liquidity driven. Hmm. And so one of the interesting dynamics has been that there has not been obviously a lot of capital markets activity. So you haven't had IPOs, you haven't had a lot of distributions going back to investors in privates. That's created an opportunity for investors on the other side. So if I thought about themes, secondary private equity. The opportunity and be a solution provider to big investors in private equity that need to rebalance. Think pension funds, endowments. Um, that's a very attractive opportunity. Credit on the liquidity spectrum, which we just talked about, has been really interesting. The idea that you can be a senior direct lender at yields that are double digit today, very, very attractive risk return. So I think that liquidity theme has been really interesting. And I would say that extends even to private companies. So if you think about what's happened, you know, companies today are staying longer, staying private much longer than they had in the past, right? They're staying private for 10 years or more before they go public. But that means that their early investors and their employees need liquidity. Mm. And so you see transactions like, for example, Stripe, 
where they did a very large secondary last year. And interestingly, we were able to allow our individual investors, our private wealth clients, to get access to that secondary. So a solution for their early investors and an interesting entry point and access to a you know, phenomenal company that's still private today. So let's talk about the secondary market for a second, because we've heard reports, particularly in private equity, of some of the big pension plans, for example, wanting to get some distributions back. And a lot of the people haven't wanted to sell, particularly real estate, at, at lower valuations. How deep is that secondary market? And at some point, if it's deep enough, do you really not have to give up much liquidity and alternatives? So it's grown tremendously. If you look at what the secondary market for private equity is today versus 25 years ago, it is significantly deeper, but it's still just scratching the surface in terms of what's allocated on the primary markets to private equity. Um, but I think that secondary trends get continue. And as more and more of the growth and investments go to the private markets, the secondary market's going to follow. And so you do see institutions using that secondary market more actively to get liquidity. And I think that will translate into private companies as well, right, where they're realizing that maybe they don't want to be public or they want to defer that for longer. And they can because the private company is there, private capital is there to fuel their growth. And if they can ultimately solve the liquidity func function, which is to get their employees liquidity after a decade, to get those early investors liquidity, and they can do that in private markets, then, then you know, maybe that becomes a reason to prolong the IPO even further. So in the same way that you're saying that you know, some of these ultra high wealthy individuals should increase their exposure to alternatives, it sounds like the private companies would say the same thing because they also need that, that capital and that liquidity. No, 100%. And I think the other thing you're seeing is alternative asset managers are looking to tap into individual investors. And why? Because, as we said, the growth has come from the institutions over the past several decades. It's going to be tapping into the trillions of wealth in the individual market that's going to fuel the growth going forward. By the same token, individuals really need to have access to the private markets because what you're seeing is that more and more of the economy is in private hands versus public hands, right? We have almost 50% fewer public companies today mm. than we did two decades ago. We have five times the number of private equity-backed private companies. And so as an individual investor, if you're not investing in the private markets, you're missing out on a lot of the growth in the economy and a whole lot of economic activity that you're not having exposure to by only investing in public markets.